uh, Early Achievement Award in 2017, ERC Starting Grant in 2016, IEEE Communication Society Best Researcher Award in 2014, and many other best paper awards from top conferences. He is a distinguished lecturer for the IEEE Information Society uh, this year and the next year, and he will give us his lecture on machine learning in the air. First, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. So I think uh, it's going to be uh, a bit uh, interesting to do this kind of online workshops, but I believe uh, there are going to be more and more of these, and we are all um, getting used to probably both attending and uh, giving talks at these workshops. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about, uh, let me give a very kind of uh, brief synopsis of the talk, just in case uh, you, and now that, you know, everybody's at home, you know, the, you might lose interest or you might uh, have your kids come into the rooms, which might happen for me, by the way. Uh, so, so what's the, the kind of very short uh, uh, summary of this talk is that, so I, I will argue that the, the, the next big challenge in, in machine learning today is to extend the success of machine learning algorithms to, uh, to network of agents. And when particularly these, these network of agents have to, are, are distributed physically, and which means that they will have to communicate with each other. So I kind of find this uh, very similar to kind of the development of intelligence in, in, for humans that we probably first you know, developed our brains, you know, learned to kind of interact with our environment, uh, develop tools, etc. But then kind of the next big step came when people developed language and they started kind of communicating and kind of uh, di uh, distributing this uh, uh, intelligence and uh, what they learned among each other but this was also mainly limited to their uh, vicinity and and then the the second maybe biggest uh, step forward came when we uh, developed uh, writing that we, we managed to communicate not just with our uh, physical neighbors but also uh, ac across time on in longer distances so these all show that show the, the the importance of communications when we talk about learning and I believe that uh, in, in machine learning so far, obviously there are, there are many, many big successes, but this communication aspect is something we are just starting to uh, think about and maybe uh, learn about. And, and uh, we, especially as uh, people from the communications uh, side of things have, I believe, a lot to, to say about this. And the main focus, of course, this is a very, very general topic, uh, distributed machine learning uh, in general. But the, the main focus of my research and this talk is going to be on uh, when machine learning meets uh, wireless communications, when these agents are somehow connected through wireless links, either during the training stage or during the inference stage. And the particular, of course, focus is on the wireless network edge. So these devices at the, at the very edge of the network, typically connected to wireless links. Uh, okay, so the first, uh, of course, acknowledgements to my students, uh, postdocs. So this is uh, some of our group members, uh, not all current members, of course, but uh, either I will talk about some of their work today or some of the ideas that I will uh, uh, talk about are uh, thanks to them and of course uh, our founders. So this is basically, we are Information Processing and Communications Lab located at Imperial College London in, uh, uh, in London. And uh, you can see also more kind of about our research in our uh, group website. Okay, so we can all agree, I guess, that the, the, the success of uh, machine learning can be attributed to three major factors. One of them is, of course, the massive data sets that you know you collect more and more data these days, and uh, we can store more data, process more data, and uh, and of course the growing size and complexity of models that we try to learn, and more importantly, the the enormous processing power we have today that we can process massive data sets and uh, complex models. So we can kind of combine the two and come up with. It's kind of complex models based on huge data sets. 
of course, we the trend is to kind of increase both the, the size of the data sets and the complexity and the, the size of the models. But even though the processing power is quite impressive, what we have today compared to uh, years ago, even a decade ago, the, the, the scale, the, the trend of the, the how much the, the processing power improves over time cannot meet the, the, the growth in data sets or the, the models. So the, the challenge is that today, many of the these huge models that or the, the big uh, large data sets we have, we cannot process them on a uh, on the on a on a single machine. So the the, the of course the solution for that is to uh, parallelize some of distribute uh, the these machine learning algorithms. So now many machine learning algorithms are actually parallelizable. So the, uh, that is already kind of a big benefit. So we can now exploit the, the resources, computational resources of many, many machines, and somehow you know, scale, hopefully, the, the processing speed linearly with the number of uh, workers that we use. But of course, it's not as easy as it sounds, even though these algorithms are parallelizable. The problem is that when you scale things to many machines, of course, now these machines have to communicate with each other. So in the in the kind of easy let's say setting, if these are in a kind of big uh, server farm, so they are physically uh, next to each other, still you know you might have maybe wired connections, but still you need to develop some communication algorithm that uh, enables this distributed learning. And typically, what uh, people observe is that when you increase the this number of uh, worker servers. The, the processing speed does not scale linearly as communication becomes more and more bottleneck. And moreover, of course, there's the challenge that typically these servers, especially in the case when maybe um, you are using, let's say, computational resources like Amazon Web Services that, that are distributed uh, uh, physically and, and these servers might not be homogeneous and you become kind of limited by the, the, the slowest uh, of these workers. So now uh, both kind of the communication uh, and the computation space becomes a challenge. But there are also kind of even more challenging cases where uh, communication maybe let's say is more essential and more challenging is, is when the, the, the data that actually we, we uh, collect is distributed across let's say nodes on for example an IoT network. So we are uh, adopting more and more IoT devices, collecting more and more data through these devices. So now in this case, the data is distributed intrinsically. And moreover, so the decision making, the, the processing also has to be distributed. So many of these devices, let's say uh, autonomous uh, vehicles, drones, etc., cetera, even, even mobile phones, have quite uh, powerful processing uh, power, but uh, but they are distributed. Again, now we need communication to somehow orchestrate the processing across uh, these devices. So what is the kind of the, the current uh, uh, convention is that, you know, we, we collect data across these edge devices and somehow offload this data to a powerful uh, central, let's say, cloud server where we can run whatever processing power we want and then train a huge, very complex uh, uh, model, but but this approach has uh, as its limitations. And what uh, what are these limitations? First of all, if we talk about particularly the the inference uh, uh, phase, so when we actually want to make decisions uh, on our data, so that there are typically in many applications latency constraints. Uh, for example, if you want an autonomous car to make a decision about some uh, people on the streets and it's about its environment and take actions on that uh, you you cannot dis, uh, basically allow many vehicles to jointly kind of exchange information etc uh, over long uh, delays so the, the delay of such kind of distributed decision making becomes a becomes a bottom is a, is a serious problem and there's of course the growing privacy issue so we we can for example harness the photos taken by all the mobile phones in the world to come up with the best uh, uh, image, uh, let's say, uh, image uh, 
uh, vision detection algorithms, which is, which is currently happening, but people are getting more and more concerned about this. So we don't want to actually offload our private information to some untrusted cloud server for, for even if uh, we want to kind of uh, use that uh, powerful uh, learning model. And, and then in general, there, there are of course the issues of when, when especially these communications are taking place over uh, wireless links, the limited bandwidth and power. So this is particularly an issue when the, the, the information content of these uh, data sets are limited in the sense that you collect huge amount of data, but maybe there's little to learn from them. So offloading huge amount of data, uh, data to a uh, edge server or a cloud server might not be worth the, the kind of the, the amount of learning you will get from this. So in all these cases, uh, basically the, the communication becomes, becomes an issue. So we need to kind of uh, uh, harness the, the processing power and the data distributed over a ne uh, network through some distributed intelligence. Okay, so, so I guess it's more or less clear that when uh, we have in many cases, uh, agents distributed uh, physically, so they want to uh, learn uh, together and so they need to communicate. But so what's the problem about this? So we already know how, you know, how to deal with communications. So even in the case of uh, these links being, let's say, wireless and hence unreliable, we already have very good uh, communication protocols. We have error correction codes, we know how to compress data, we know how to do uh, multi-access, uh, random access, radio access uh, protocols, so on and so forth. And especially, for example, in 5G, uh, we, we even, you know, kind of extended our uh, vision to include, to kind of focus our network design, not on just like particular type of uh, data and, and data rate and reliability trade-offs, but now we, our networks are even more flexible. Uh, to have a much uh, higher degree of freedom to trade off latency, reliability, rate, or the resources that we have in the network. So the, the, the argument is that, so is there something really uh, fundamentally interesting for, from a communication perspective? So, so the, the statement that, yes, the current communication systems are not designed maybe with many typical machine learning applications in mind, but could, can we just, you know, uh, overcome this uh, simply by, you know, playing with the parameters of our communication networks and operate on whatever the, the required uh, point on this, uh, on this multidimensional trade-off curve. So maybe the, the main uh, technical message of this talk is that this is not the case because there are kind of interesting uh, requirements and, you know, settings uh, stemming from the particular learning applications that actually says, you know, like this approach can co completely separating the communication network design and the machine learning algorithm design would be strictly suboptimal. And we have actually a lot to gain from the joint design. And this gain can be particularly significant when we look into, when we are interested in uh, machine learning uh, algorithms, which are, uh, basically the, the type of uh, performance measures we have for machine learning algorithms. Okay, so uh, kind of to, to briefly uh, summarize what, uh, what, I will, what I have said and maybe what I will you know, go into more details is that you know, machine learning algorithms communication protocols are currently uh, designed separately. But of course, communications, especially in the wireless setting introduces not just delays, which is of course an issue, but also errors, so which are often ignored by in the machine learning literature. So even, so as I said that, you know, the current kind of biggest achievement of the, the machine learning algorithms are more about centralized uh, processing. But of course, I have to say that there's a already a, a huge literature that talks about this kind of communication bottleneck of distributed learning and how, you know, we can reduce the communication requirements, the amount of communication, et cetera. But I have to note that, a majority of those works in, uh, consider error-free channels, maybe rate-limited channels, but they do not really take into account the kind of the, the wireless uh, channel imperfections that, that we know today, so that we know very well. And so the, the, the goal of this talk, as I said, is to somehow look into uh, how, how we can jointly design these uh, 
two aspects. And, and if, you, if you want, maybe we can call this as like machine learning on the physical layer. So how we can, you know, like uh, exploit uh, communication and coding theoretic tools for uh, the physical layer to speed up or to improve the performance of machine learning algorithms. Okay, so the talk is actually organized into more or less two parts. And because these are typically, you know, like uh, require different type of uh, processing. So one of them, the first part, I'm going to talk about distributed inference. So here, the uh, uh, from a machinery perspective, basically the assumption is that I have the resources to do some offline training. So let's assume I have some neural networks or whatever trained, but now I want to uh, somehow implement them maybe over over the the network edge over. Uh, possibly wireless things. In the second part, I'm going to talk about distributed training. So this is that, you know, we don't have any uh, network uh, trained uh, model yet, but we have the model we want to train in a distributed fashion. So that will be either, you know, the data is distributed uh, or, and then somehow these uh, can be distributed or centralized, but the processing can be distributed, so on and so forth. Okay, so the distributed inference at the edge. So as I said, uh, let, Let's assume you know there are these devices, uh, like in the picture here, autonomous car. Uh, you can even you know uh, have an, uh, a very powerful neural network model embedded on these devices. So let's say they might even have uh, so their own processing capabilities. But in in many cases, it's possible that the correct decision make uh, that uh, these devices can make might depend on data that is not locally available, so at the, at the inference stage. So for example, let's say this, this car wants to take some action, uh, detect uh, uh, pedestrians on the street or some kind of like physics, some, something about the physical environment. It, it's possible, it, it, it has all these sensors, it has the models, it has the processing power, but it's possible that some information about the physical environment that's available in a, let's say, nearby uh, base station might be needed to improve the reliability of this decision. So in that case, this, this uh, car has still needs to communicate with this maybe an edge server and, and, and the delay is, a, is a, a fundamental issue here, a fundamental challenge. Of course, there are uh, maybe even a, uh, a more kind of common case that would require communication is that many of these IoT devices that collect the data that needs to make a decision but they don't have the processing power. They say there's a bike, you know, you kind of uh, want to also make a decision about the physical environment, but the bike maybe doesn't have the processing power like an autonomous car. So it has to communicate with a, now a processing uh, unit at the edge. And again, of course, the, the, the latency and the reliability of this communication is a uh, major challenge. So we first started, we were, uh, we were we first thought, you know, how can we, uh, you know, can we formulate a, a fundamental problem that you know somehow uh, reflects these uh, these issues, and and understand the interaction between you know the, the learning part and the and the communication part. So the the formulation we came up with is uh, basically a, a hypothesis testing problem, but now over noisy channels. So interestingly, this hypothesis testing has been studied you know many many uh, for many many decades. So a lot of you know. Uh, things we know, but, but uh, somehow nobody looked into it actually, what happens when you put a, a, com a noisy communication channel in between, let's say the observer that collects the data and the detector that makes the decision. Now, the setting that when uh, we have, you know, we just have this kind of communication channel and uh, let's say the data is available at the observer, so the detector is just making the decision, so it's in the very simplest case, we can model this as a binary hypothesis testing problem. So let's assume this data observed at the observer UK comes from either distribution PU or QU. And somehow this, you know, this observer has to communicate over this noisy channel with some uh, fixed bandwidth ratio. So it has a certain number of channel users per sample. That's the constraint. And we want to make a decision at the detector. So now we can, we can for example, look at, we can either look at the, you know, the trade-off now. There will be, of course, two types of errors you can make, type one, type two. And we, you know, we can look at, in general, the trade-off between the two. Or uh, as, uh, as common in hypothesis testing literature, you can kind of limit one type, type one uh, probability of error and try to minimize and uh, maximize the, the error exponent of the type two probability of error in the, in the asymptotic uh, sense when this uh, number of 
observations and the number of channel uh, users you are allowed uh, grows uh, to infinity. So, so this problem is actually, uh, as one would expect uh, uh, intuitively, is, is as a simple solution. So it says that the observer basically just should make a decision because it has all the data. So it has, it has, it's kind of in the best position to make the most reliable decision between these two hypotheses. And all you need to make, do is to kind of then communicate this one bit of information in the most reliable manner over the channel. So then your performance is a trade-off between the typical kind of uh, uh, the error exponent you would have when you, when you make the decision at the observer, which is the limited by this uh, divergence between the two uh, hypothesis distributions and the, this kind of reliability function of the uh, the channel. So 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 this is uh, expected, as I said, because uh, so we did not put any uh, complexity constraint of the observer. So why not the observer should make the decision locally? So in general, basically, there's, there's this kind of a separation is actually optimal. So you need to make the decision and then just communicate in the best, in the most reliable manner your your decisions. And, and the main difficulty is, of course, you know, the complexity constraint is something difficult to model, to include in, the, in an information theoretic uh, model. So typically, we, we, we don't have such constraints in the, in the information theoretic formulations. But, but, but still, there's a, a more interesting scenario that's even, uh, let's say, uh, uh, very interesting from an information theoretic perspective is when the, the observer cannot make this decision locally. So it doesn't have access to all the information required to make this decision, so, which would be the case, for example, when the detector has some information also observed, this VK, and maybe the, the two hypotheses are about the joint distribution of U, U and V. Either P, these samples might be coming from some distribution PUV or QUV. So, so in general, actually, this is an open problem, even in the, uh, when the channel is uh, error-free. But when, uh, so, but we were able to solve this problem when we are testing against independence. So the, the, the alternative distribution is uh, the, the product of the marginals. So again, in that case, we are able to actually define a single letter kind of uh, information theoretic performance bound. And it says basically we need to kind of reduce some, uh, ob take some features out of these observations represented by this auxiliary random variable W, and then uh, communicate these features at the capacity of the channel. So interestingly here, uh, in the case of testing against independence, you can prove that, again, communication and the learning can be separated. So you can operate at the capacity. So you design a channel code, completely ignoring the, the, the hypothesis testing problem. But this actually does not generalize. So when this, uh, if it's not testing against independence, we are able to prove that separation can be strictly suboptimal. So this can already tells us, tells us that uh, this problem is even fundamentally is quite interesting and you can have kind of more interactions uh, between the channel, communication channel and the, this kind of learning task here is hypothesis testing that will give you better performance if you can uh, design the two jointly. Okay, so what is the kind of the practical uh, version of this problem? So the, this kind of this, uh, the distributed decision problem. So the, the, the application that we looked at is person re-identification. So this problem is a, is a very popular problem in um, uh, machine vision. So, so, so it's, it's as follows. So you, let's say you have a data set of a database of images taken from, uh, you know, of uh, a certain uh, group of people taken by different cameras. So these are completely different angles, different backgrounds, you know, you have this uh, database. And at some point, you you get another picture uh, for one of, of one of these people from one, one of these, uh, let's say, cameras. And your goal is to basically identify the if whether that person is, you know, like the belongs that image belongs to a person in your data set or not. So you want to say that okay, uh, this is the same person. Uh, let's say here. Uh, uh, this this image taken even though it's from a different angle, but you you want to detect that these these are actually the same person. So this is quite a challenging uh, task, and of course the standard approach is you know so so in in this case we are assuming that somehow this this is a this is a wireless camera connected to a, to the cloud or the, to a, to the to the edge uh, processor to a wireless thing. So the standard approach would be you know transmit take the image transmit to the to the cloud as reliably as possible. And you know, do your um, 
best three identification uh, baseline. So these are typically, you know, uh, ne uh, neural network algorithms, uh, these deep convolutional neural network architectures, like let's say based on uh, ResNet 50. And so you, you uh, capture some features of the image and then do somehow some uh, nearest neighbor detection or, or there are other uh, ways as well uh, within your uh, data set. But of course, now, Again, intuitively, if you think about it, from also depending on our uh, previous uh, results, we know that we don't really need to send all the image. So we are not really interested in the image itself. So we don't care if we can reconstruct this original image at the, the cloud. All we want is to get the, the features that are needed to make this uh, decision. So for this, so the, the first kind of thing we did is to design a task-based compression and channel coding scheme. So we said that, okay, so we have this limited uh, capacity link from the, the wireless camera to the, to the network. So we are, of course, assuming now that we want to make these decisions as quickly as possible. So we, don't, we cannot use a very large uh, bandwidth to transmit uh, uh, these images or features over the channel. So, so in this case, so what we do is that we first run a, a re-identification baseline, so get some features. Now, we, what we want is to compress these features to the rate allowed by the channel, which we will transmit reliably using uh, some uh, basically efficient uh, channel code. But now we want to do this compression as efficient as possible. So for this, uh, what we use is to first quantize this uh, latent representation, and then we look at the, the entropy of these quantized bits, which we will later do some compress further using some uh, arithmetic coding scheme. And, and the idea is to somehow uh, trade off uh, this use and uh, loss function that also takes into account the, this entropy that you get from the, after the quantization. So that, is, that gives you how much rate you need to transmit over the channel. But, but another uh, scheme which kind of uh, is motivated by the fact, you know, that as I said, that the separation approach is actually in general suboptimal, meaning that so if you, if you just compress some features and send them using the optimal capacity achieving channel code is, is in general suboptimal. So for that, and, and we know that, so that's even suboptimal, even information theoretic in the sense of, you know, asymptotic block length, etc. So we know that in practice, we don't even have asymptotic block lengths, right? We are limited by the bandwidth. And in general, this type of separation is, is definitely suboptimal. So we actually looked at in this uh, work here, not uh, any detection, any uh, uh, machine vision problem, but just to transmit images over a wireless channel. And actually you can, you can show that obviously, you know, the separation is suboptimal and we were able to actually design purely neural network based joint source channel coding schemes that can beat the state of the art let's say image compression codec combined with a capacity achieving channel code. So just kind of overcoming this limitation of separation can get you, uh, give you uh, gains. And here now we are gonna do that. We can apply the same idea for the transmission of the features because the features now we can treat as some source, some information source that we want to transmit to the receiver over a uh, wireless channel. And, and we, in general, of course, since the the channel is limited, so we, we need to do some lossy transmission of these features. So we want to design a, a neural network type uh, joint source channel uh, coder to transmit these features. So the, the benefits of this, as I said, first of all, uh, it improves the performance, but moreover, there, there is kind of an interesting uh, uh, side benefit is the fact that this type of joint source, deep joint source channel coder, so this is also what we observed in this uh, paper, is, a, is an analog communication system. So we don't limit ourselves to transmit, you know, either to, to turn the image into bits or even to transmit for a, man, a constrained constellation. So we completely, you know, let the, the encoder to, you know, to be free to whatever it wants to transmit over the channel. And this, this becomes a, since all the, almost all the operations of, that you do on the neural network are type, you know, similar to analog operations, you, you get an analog type of communication system rather than a digital communication system. And which gives you a graceful degradation, meaning that if, you, if the channel quality changes over time, you know, it's, uh, so you don't need to target a fixed uh, channel quality. 
as opposed to in digital communications, if you want to do it like a capacity or achieving channel code, you need a very reliable uh, estimation of the channel quality. And if for some reason, what you experience uh, is worse than your estimation, you will lose everything. So there's this kind of a cliff effect. Whereas this type of, uh, in, the, in this uh, architecture, when we use this kind of uh, joint compression and channel coding scheme, even if the channel quality changes, gets better or worse, you know, your performance, end-to-end -end performance changes gracefully. So here, some results. So if, for example, limit uh, 128 users of an AWGN channel at this uh, SNR, here SNR is given the, at the bottom. And you can see that, you know, if you look at the top one accuracy, so basically, you know, we want to see if the, the system is able to identify the correct uh, person what, it, at what rate. So we can see that here, so this is the digital approach, assuming capacity achieving channel code, even though it's only 128 channels. So we are quite generous to the this, uh, digital uh, separation based approach. This is the reliability you will get, even if you are using actually uh, a task-based compression scheme is the compressing the features for the purpose of detection. Now, if you were to use actually compression of the image itself to transmit and then to do uh, re-ID at the, the remote uh, receiver, that wouldn't be even in this figure. So it would require a huge amount of SMR and at this, at this bandwidth, of course. So these are two different kind of versions of this joint source channel coding uh, scheme and you can see that it's significantly better and actually at some even at 10 db you actually achieve the, the the performance as if you what you would have if all the data was available to the decision maker so you kind of completely overcome the the channel noise and of course as you increase the channel bandwidth you have more and more bandwidth and these are still very very limited, short kind of block lengths uh you can you can get uh almost even at let's say five minus five db you are as good as you would be if you had the data uh, at the, the, the decision maker and it, i said that uh, another challenge typically in practice is when your device doesn't have the necessary processing power or it's slow so it would take a lot of time to do the same decision making whereas maybe you have a much more powerful processor at the edge so as I said, this is difficult to model from an information theory perspective, but we know again, in general, of course, this type of uh, separation would, be, uh, uh, would not be possible, would be suboptimal. So here, the typical approach is to do a, kind of this co-inference by splitting the, the deep neural network. So in the literature, what, do people, what people do is that they train kind of a, this very you know, deep, uh, let, let's say, ResNet structure. And then they say that, okay, so I divide it into two. So the, the device, uh, let's say a smartwatch, runs only the first few layers due to its limited processing power, and the rest will be run on the, the edge server. So the, of course, what we need now is to communicate these features over, this, over the link. So the typically people at uh, this, this literature, they look into, again, error-free links. So they, but they still need to compare. So they look at rate limited links. So, so how, somehow, because this is actually a nice figure here, if you look at the data size of the features in the, in the kind of this uh, ResNet uh, network, the, if the input size is this, you see that actually at the initial layers, you're actually expanding your uh, space or your data. So this is typically what this deep neural network do. So they first expand and then uh, reduce the size. So if you are actually, if you, if you can only do a few layers, you end up having to transmit a huge amount of the, even a larger amount of uh, data to over the wireless link. So, so typically the literature, what they do is that they use some sort of uh, image compression tools, you know, standard compression tools, typically the, uh, based on image uh, compression to, to reduce the size of that feature vector. Or there are some basically in this work, you know, they design some neural network uh, uh, based compression scheme for the for feature compression but what we said is again uh, motivated by the uh, the previous result is that if if you want to you know if if you kind of just look at how many bits you need to transmit so this inherently assumes that you separate communication so you do you, you assume that you actually have a reliable uh, way of communicating these bits over things so otherwise you need to take into account that you know it's some probability you, this uh, you will not be able to transmit the bits. So 
Uh, so we said basically, so why don't we actually do this kind of joint source channel uh, coding of these features just like we did before. And now we can actually look at the, the, the joint complexity you know, the, of both the, the, the channel coding, or, and this, there's no explicit channel coding, but basically the channel transmission and the whatever learning we do. So here again, we, what we do is that we combine the first layers now take the features, but transmit these features using this kind of joint source channel, a deep joint source channel coding scheme. Of course, to kind of reduce the complexity compared to our previous designs, what we did is to uh, reduce the complexity of the encoder of this deep JSCC and transfer the complexity more to the, to the decoder side. And if you compare with, you know, this kind of state of the art scheme, so this actual ultimate plus plus is, uh, is a scheme that considers actually this kind of the, the noisy channel as well. And on top of it, we were able to reduce the on-device computation much more by using pruning. So pruning is a, is a common, com, common tool in uh, neural networks to reduce the complexity because uh, people have observed that actually many of the connections in a neural network, we can basically remove them without uh, a big uh, decrease in the accuracy. So that's what we did if we kind of allow there's a 2% two, two reduction in the end-to-end uh, -end accuracy of the system. Uh, here you can see that is the, for a limited on-device computation of, you know, let's say 100 uh, megaflops, we can see that we can reduce the uh, channel bandwidth significantly. So these are actually in the uh, logarithmic scale compared to the state of the art. So this is again basically using this kind of uh, pruning plus uh, deep joint source channel coding feature transmission. So this again, so because all these examples show that if you take into account kind of the, the physical layer, the reliability, the, you know, the, the errors and the, the latency over the channel, you, you can gain a lot for the inference of kind of this type of deep neural networks at the, at the edge. And we will probably need many more uh, kind of uh, interesting and uh, intelligent designs, you know, how we can do these things jointly. Okay, so this is uh, more or less uh, what I wanted to say about uh, uh, distributed inference at the edge. At the edge, and now I will start the the second part of the talk, where I will be talking about uh, this about distributed training. So in the distrib in distributed training, so the the main challenge is that so. As I said, we have a huge amount of data and we want to train a model, a very large complex model. And now we cannot run this on a single machine. So the processing power of a single machine is not gonna be sufficient to handle such uh, complexity and data. So as an example, uh, this DeepMind's AlphaGo, the famous AlphaGo uh, result, was obtained by uh, using this running the algorithm, uh, the training of the, this deep reinforcement learning algorithm on 1,920 CPUs and 280 GPUs, and and for a very long kind of uh, training time as well. So this kind of gives you the the scale of the things. Of course, you know, for such examples, maybe you're not so much limited about the the time. You know, if you want to just do once and then you know, write a paper about it and uh, do it offline. Uh, uh, and all, all you need is a basically an impressive result. But if you want to kind of scale these things and do these things, apply these things to many, many applications in parallel, of course, uh, we, we need these uh, algorithms to run, to be very reliable and to be very efficient. So, so, the, so, so the first kind of model for uh, these problems is more uh, on, on what I just said. So we have, let's say, a, a master server, which has huge amount of data, but it cannot you know, process the data itself. So somehow it needs to uh, harness the processing power of many different worker machines. So now you know, through some communication links with these uh, machines, so it, it, but, but the main issue is that here, this master server has the, the freedom of, you know, it can decide how to distribute the, distribute the data and tell the workers what type of computations to do. Another very interesting and very relevant uh, scenario for more from a wireless networking perspective is this kind of federated learning setting is when actually the data itself is distributed. So now that the devices have acquired uh, their own data and either 
because of you know privacy concerns or the the limitations in bandwidth or power of these devices so they you know they cannot uh they don't want to send all the data to the to the central server and somehow they want to train a joint model and 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 in general also for this uh setting there can be different kind of uh models and i, I think it's a, it's a very very rich uh uh, application area for, for also from a communication perspective and uh, so I will be talking about today mainly uh, this type of centralized uh, which is called a parameter server type uh, architectures where basically there's this one central parameter server that orchestrates the learning across these uh, different machines but you can also have uh, the kind of more kind of decentralized setting where these devices uh, will communicate through you know, device to device links rather than uh, assuming the existence of this kind of uh, parameter, centralized parameter server. I think, yeah, both are very interesting uh, uh, scenarios. Okay, so let me first give a very brief kind of summary of uh, what is the distributed uh, learning problem. I know that there will be many more kind of uh, uh, interesting, even you know, much more technical, detailed uh, discussions on this during the workshop. But you know, just for kind of completeness, let me give this kind of very basic uh, overview. So the goal is that you know, we want to learn a model, this kind of parameterized by this theta across this data set. This you know, we denote this data set as D. So it is it consists of many uh, data and labels. So this here we're assuming a, a supervised learning setting. We have data, labels, x, y pairs. And so we want to find the model theta somehow that minimizes this kind of uh, empirical loss, this uh, function L that's specific to the application across this data set. And we know that in general, this can be solved uh, as a common uh, way of solving this type of problems is gradient descent. So what we do is that we kind of try to learn this uh, parameter vector in, a, in an iterative way. And at each step, so we have a current model and we kind of update it along the gradient uh, descent direction. And so we, we, at each iteration, basically, we need to find this gradient across the data set. So, so which uh, direction we need to update our model. Now, the nice thing is that, so this type of, you know, gradient descent type of application is very uh, much amenable to distributed uh, implementation. So all, you, all we need to do is uh, to distribute the data set across these uh, workers. So we can give one chunk of the data set, let's say to each worker. Now at each step, all I need is to, you know, to compute this kind of uh, full gradient, let's call it. I, I can uh, uh, retract partial gradients from each of the workers and simply take their average to recover the full gradient and this master server can update now the model along the kind of the gradient direction. So this is great, but as I said initially, there is of course, you know, due to this kind of communication required uh, between the these workers and the, the master server, the communication becomes the kind of the main bottleneck. So there are many methods to, to overcome this in the machine learning literature. This is just a one slide, very extreme brief uh, summary of that very uh, interesting literature. So one of them, one of the approaches is uh, assumes a gradient compression. So the idea is to somehow, you know, instead of sending the, the gradient vector as it is, so we can try to compress it into as few bits as possible. So there are many different algorithms on this. The second approach with the gradient sparsification. So instead of compressing it, you know, like into bits, the assumption is, you know, I can actually remove many of the unsignificant uh, entries and then send a very kind of reduced dimension gradient. So it's just another way of uh, compressing the gradient information. Or another approach would be to reduce the communication frequency. So instead of, you know, computing, you know, uh, based on uh, maybe one batch of your data, in the case of uh, stochastic gradient descent, uh, implemented in a distributed manner, what we can do is then you know, we can do, we can increase the batch size, so you can do more computation locally, which means that you have less comp uh, communication, kind of per com computation, or you can even run multiple kind of uh, 
local iterations. So you can do multiple iterations of a stochastic gradient descent, update the model, and then instead of sending the gradient, you can send the, the model update. So it's kind of all different methods. You can uh, use uh, a combination of these as well. But there is another challenge that is kind of orthogonal to the, the kind of the amount of communication that uh, we need to have from the workers to the server, which is about the kind of the straggling behavior. So the straggling behavior, the idea is that, you know, so we need these uh, gradient estimates, so these local gradient estimates from the servers at the, uh, the, the parameter server to take the average. Now, the, the challenge is that, you know, typically in practice, uh, these servers, even, even if, you know, they might have kind of uh, similar processing power, but for various reasons, they might have different... Uh, inhomogeneous response times. So they, it might take them some random amount of time, maybe uh, averaged across some mean uh, at, at every iteration. So you, you, you typically don't know exactly how long it will take them to kind of compute these gradients. Moreover, now that you know, like they need to co communicate these gradients to the network, there are also uh, delays that might be due to communication over this network. Now, which means that, you know, in this kind of implementation, if I want to kind of recover the full gradient at each iteration, this means that I need to wait the response from every worker at each iteration. So I will be limited by the communication or the computation speed of the, the slowest so-called straggling server. And this may lead to a significant slowdown in the process. So we, we might actually lose completely the, the gain that we, we were expecting from this uh, distributed uh, parallel processing across a network of devices. Okay, so there are, again, many, many uh, solutions uh, that have been uh, proposed in the literature. I will mainly uh, talk about kind of uh, how we can use ideas from coding and communication uh, to, to solve this problem. So the, the so one approach is to to introduce backup servers. So now we can actually have more servers and instead of maybe, so I mean, we, we, develop, we divide the data. And remember, so if in the case of stochastic gradient descent, so each uh, worker, instead of uh, computing the gradient based on all its data, it just chooses a batch. So it basically uh, computes an estimate of an unbiased estimate of its uh, local gradient and sends it back. So now I can have, you know, I can introduce more servers and instead of hoping to get from, you know, result from all of them, I can only wait a certain number of them. So in a way I can ignore a slowest, you know, uh, bunch of the servers. So instead of being limited by the, the slowest server now, I will be limited by the, the Kate, you know, like the Ant slowest server. So this will definitely, uh, provide some trade-off, but you know, this is based on, in a way, the idea is to introduce, you know, like more uh, servers and which, which brings some redundancy, right? But in a way, uh, we, can, we can do something a little bit, uh, let's say, smarter. We can introduce the redundancy at the, at the worker level. So, so what we can do is that we can say that, okay, since the workers have this kind of uh, different processing speeds, I can actually try to exploit the, the faster servers to compensate for the slower ones. So, so to be able to do that, I need to introduce now uh, redundant computation. So instead of, for example, instead of giving one chunk of data to each of the uh, servers, when I want to get a full gradient recovery, not, in the, uh, not necessarily in the stochastic gradient descent setting. So let's say normally I would give them one piece each and I would wait all three to respond with their gradients. Now, instead, I'm actually giving two pieces of data to each. So now each piece of data uh, set is uh, replicated at two of the workers. And I, I basically say that, okay, try to compute both, you know, gradients based on both uh, chunk, uh, chunk of data. So you get two estimates. And then, so if you complete the two, then send me some linear combination of your computations. And these linear combinations are kind of fixed in advance. And, and for example, in this uh, setting here, so I have these kind of linear combinations and you can see that actually, if this uh, worker does not respond for some reason, so it's let's say uh, struggling at this uh, iteration. So I have now these two 
uh, linearly combined kind of graded estimates. And you can see that there is there exists some linear combination of the two that will actually give me this, uh, the sum of the gradients, and which is what the master server is interested in. And you can actually verify that this is the case for any two out of these three servers. You can always recover this uh, full gradient. Now, uh, so what we did here in principle is uh, we kind of increase the computation load, which is denoted by this parameter R. So here it's two, to compensate kind of uh, for the slowest servers. And, and uh, but of course, this required us to design this, you know, uh, special coding scheme, uh, which basically, you know, like any combination, any, uh, let's say, K out of uh, these N servers is, is kind of uh, good enough to, to span kind of this uh, full gradient vector. So this is quite a nice idea. And actually, they, you know, they have also in this uh, paper where they introduced this, they, they also, uh, showed as an as an example that you know like this type of you know full gradient uh, this gradient coding type of computation actually gives you better uh, reliability compared to ignoring the struggling service if you just you know like kept every time just the, the few best ones so you wouldn't get as as you could. of course this depends uh, so I have to kind of uh, um, make some conditional statement here that this might not be the case for all types of applications okay so uh, it turns out that you can do even uh, more interesting type of uh, codes and this kind of trade-off between uh, reliability and and then the communication and the, the, the computation uh, with across workers for more kind of specific, especially like linear regression type of problems. So what happens is in, in the case of linear regression, now I can write this kind of this uh, uh, squared error loss uh, function. And, and the gradients now can be written in this uh, vector form. So here, basically, this X is the, the, the data matrix, stacked data matrix. So each one you can consider as one uh, data sample. And so now every iteration, I need to compute this gradient. I want to compute this in a distributed manner. But if you notice, this is X transpose Y is just a function of the data. So this is just, you know, uh, the data samples and the labels. So we know this from the very beginning. So we, we, we need to do this just once. And so what we need to really compute every time is this uh, multiplication. And this is a matrix matrix multiplication. And we can write this matrix matrix multiplication in this form, which is an outer product. So basically here, if you can see, so this is now, uh, so I, I, can, I can divide this into kind of sub matrices, X1, X2, XK, K matrices. And I can write this uh, multiplication in a, as a sum of these k multiplications. So now, which means that if I can ask, you know, a different server to compute each of these multiplications, I can simply add the results. So it's a nice way of distributed, uh, implementing distributed matrix matrix multiplication. And Furthermore, if I looked at, you know, the same problem as you see here, you know, x transpose x to the t uh, minus x transpose y. So here we said that this could be done once, but moreover, we can actually see that this matrix matrix multiplication is also just, you know, is constant throughout the iteration. So I can actually also do that once. So now I get this W matrix, you know, uh, matrix vector multiplication. And, and basically all I need to do is to, to, to do this computation every time in a distributed way. And now here it's, it's even simpler kind of to see a way to, you know, distribute it. So this is just, a, so I can actually just, you know, divide this into, again, you know, like some matrices. Let's say here I divide it into two. So, so one way to, to parallelize e this easily is to just divide this W into kind of three parts. And each one, you know, each worker could do just, you know, W1, theta T, W2, theta T, W3, theta T, and I would just get the, 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 the result putting the three together. But if you want, if I want to introduce some redundancy to trade off between, you know, fast and slow servers, I can actually divide into two instead. So now each worker needs to do more uh, computations because they are kind of multiplying it in larger dimensional matrix rather than one third of W, they are multiplying one half of W theta T. Uh, but now, you know, I can assign this W1 plus W2 to the third server. Now I have this redundancy, right? So this is like a linear code uh, to give me redundancy. So any two out of three will give me my required slot. So this was actually the first kind of uh, 
time that this type of coded uh, computation idea was uh, introduced for this kind of regression problem in this paper. And there are many extensions on it, which I will also talk about uh, in a bit. So now going back to this matrix matrix multiplication, one of the nice uh, implementations of this is actually through this Lagrange uh, coded computing. So here, you know, like what we do is we divide this matrix that we want to uh, compute into this kind of uh, R groups. Now each one, let's say, you know, the XKJ is the J element on the, in the K group. And we form this R uh, structurally identical polynomials using, you know, different elements of this kind of R parts of this uh, matrix. So this is like a Lagrange polynomial. So this is like this, you know, if you are, uh, if you remember your, if you know about, you know, polynomial coding in general, basically this is the, the, the same idea. And, uh, but the, the idea, so this is the kind of, we can interpolate the way, you know, we're interpolating a polynomial using kind of these uh, different uh, values of it in different routes. So we choose this arbitrary points. And then what we are doing is actually, what we will do is that we will actually require each worker to compute this function that um, this, this polynomials at different arbitrary points. And by kind of collecting a subset uh, sufficiently enough of them to interpolate a desired polynomial will be enough to then we will recover the polynomial from that we will basically recover the what we want to compute. So here, so you know, these are the polynomials we form, but this is the polynomial that we want to recover, which is actually the result of this multiplication. So they get this kind of WKs, FKs, which are linear combinations of the data. So they do the multiplication of this kind of coded data. So instead of not having the data, it's how they're having the coded data. They're multiplying. And so this, this H polynomial has this degree to n over R minus two. So I need, you know, uh, one more of this, uh, uh, evaluations of this HC polynomial to be able to interpolate that. And once I have HC, if I know HC at the master, I can now compute these different values of this H polynomial at different alpha I values that you know we initially fixed. And summing them will give me exactly this X, the computation that I want. So this is kind of using this type of you know polynomial coding ideas to have to to, to implement this distributed computation. So here we also there's an example, but you know I won't go into the you know go through that in detail. But the idea is again, so basically we have this kind of now you know we send to the workers coded data. We centrally you know like did this coding, which is just a kind of a linear uh, combinations of the original data vectors, and uh, each worker just computes all these three form this kind of one uh, result as a kind of linear combination of all these uh, three computations and sends that result once it's completed. And as long as, you know, if we have, so the degree of H is in this particular case is uh, three. Uh, so I, so, it's, uh, so this is two, but I need to get from, you know, response from three workers. So if these are, you know, like struggling, it doesn't matter as long as I get three results, I can uh, interpolate H and then I can get basically what I want, the, the full computation. So now this is, you know, in general, this kind of coded computation, this, uh, especially in the, this kind of linear uh, coding schemes are, are quite interesting, quite nice, you know, again, using the ideas from uh, coding theory in, in distributed uh, computation to, to overcome the, the struggling behavior, either because of the, comp you know, uh, inhomogeneous computation times or some uh, inhomogeneous delays over the communication network. But there are, you know, like two limitations of this approach. So one of them is that, so this, this kind of, uh, the, the, the redundancy that we introduce, this, this R parameter, it, it determines the recovery threshold, right? So how many, you know, like workers that, so that we need to be able to recover. But this needs to be done very carefully and it requires actually the ideal kind of optimal choice of this will depend on the, the computation speeds of the workers, which we might not know. For example, if I set R is equal to N, that everybody does all the computations before responding. So this means obviously now I can uh, recover the result from a one worker. So each worker is doing the whole computation. So it's great, the, the, the recovery rate is you know, very low, the recovery uh, threshold, but of course, I need to wait, you know, a lot for each worker to compute uh, all the computation. So there's this trade-off. And in general, there's a chance that I'm doing over computation. If I fix this R basically too much, 
I, I end up waiting a lot, even one worker to compete, even the fastest worker to complete his computation. Right? So there's kind of over computation uh, problem. Another problem is that, you know, like here the assumption is that, you know, if a worker is straggler, so it doesn't send me anything, I don't need its information, I completely ignore its computation. But in practice, if we actually, you know, like uh, simulate these type of systems, what we will see is that, yes, they, these workers might have different processing speeds, but they are not significantly different from each other. They're typically, you know, centered around some average computation, but some are a bit higher, a bit lower. And in that case, basically, we are uh, not utilizing at all the com uh, computations done by this kind of relatively slower uh, service, so which are called non-persistent strangers. So they're not, not like, they're not doing anything. So they are just a bit slower. Uh, so, so to overcome this, what we uh, introduced is to kind of trade off computation and communication in the sense that, you know, instead of, uh, requesting each worker to do all the computations before communicating, we will allow them to send multiple messages. So if you're a very fast server, I will allow you actually to send the result of your first computation when it is completed. And if you later run more computation and get further results, you can send another message, which is not allowed in all the kind of the previous uh, implementations. So here, for example, you know, I can give you know, like three uh, different computations and you know, the, the server computes first one, sends it, second one sends it, this one sends the, the, its first computation, which is just the third one, and I'm done. So I don't even need anything, but here, as you can see, uh, so I, I get some partial results. So this wouldn't be possible in the kind of this coded computation framework. So for this, the, the one thing that we kind of, uh, the one uh, of the results that we had was, uh, Instead of having this, uh, remember, so we had before R polynomials, structurally the same polynomials, but each worker was basically computing one value of these, you know, like different polynomials and then uh, sending a linear combination of these results. So now we form instead a single polynomial of degree, you know, n minus one. And now this H polynomial, the multiplication is degree two n minus two. And I send to workers as before, again, the, the uh, computation uh, redundancy is R. So I, I send R different coded, you know, vectors to be computed at this polynomial. So this is this, this computed, uh, these coded vectors are, you know, different kind of uh, evaluations of this uh, polynomial Fz at different points, R different points. And each one basically does now this multiplication. So they get this kind of computation of Fz different, at different uh, values. When they do the computation, basically they get different evaluations of H at different uh, R points. And I allow them to send each one as they, as soon as they compute. Now, the difference here is that now this H polynomial has a much higher degree than before. So our kind of recovery threshold, if you think about it, is higher. But instead of getting only one computation from each server, I can get actually multiple, you know, up to R computations. So if you're a super fast server, you can send me R messages. So I, I can get R different evaluations of the same uh, polynomial. So here, for example, you know, I have, uh, I, I, I need to collect this 11 computations and I can collect it as any combination. So of course, this is now much better, especially if these servers are, you know, not completely, you know, uh, regular, not regular. So even not some very slow, you know, relatively slower server can give me a certain number of evaluations. And here, you know, if you actually look at the average completion time with some underlying assumption on the, let's say the computation is uh, computation speed of the, the workers, here you can see that this kind of uh, multi-message version of, so this is what gradient coding would have. So the Lagrange coded computing is much better. It has much kind of lower, better, more efficient uh, recovery threshold. But here, by using this multi-message aspect, we get actually even much faster. But of course, there's the trade-off. The trade-off is that, we are introducing more more communication, more communication in the sense that you know the total number of messages that needs to be sent to the uh, master is higher. But on the other hand, we have to say that actually you know these messages are not so before all the all the workers do so, same number of computations and they all send as soon as you know they complete all the computations. If they are similar computation speed, they might end up actually sending all simultaneously. Whereas now here these messages might be actually more kind of uh, staggered across time. So here, for example, average completion time, as you see, is much lower with this uh, uh, Lagrange, multi-message Lagrange coded computing. And here you can see also, for example, increasing R for the, the traditional, it is kind of 
the original Lagrange quantum computing, as you increase that, at some point it's actually hurting you. So you need to wait more for each server to respond. But, uh, but of course, here, you know, now, the communication of the total number of messages can be higher. Now, of course, the real kind of trade-off will depend on what kind of communication protocol you do, right? So this increasing number of messages, what is really the impact of it? If it's slowing a lot to communication, this might be worse, but actually you have a communication protocol that kind of take care of these things in a more efficient manner. Maybe it's not, it's going to be much better in terms of the end-to-end -end, uh, computation time. And here, basically, what uh, I'm showing you is that this, this approach, so we had like one polynomial compared to our polynomial. You can actually have anything in between. So there's a kind of a, so our scheme has this kind of very general kind of uh, spectrum of different implementations. Okay, so uh, let me see. So I have uh, about half an hour. So I will briefly talk about this another aspect. So as we said, you know, like if we are doing this kind of linear regression problems, if I do this computation initially, this matrix matrix multiplication once, now I can have this kind of uh, matrix vector multiplication, which I can, you know, easily distribute. The interesting thing is that now if I don't get some results, so, okay, so I can do the coding to kind of target full gradient recovery. So it's easy. I can use any kind of MDS code, you know, like linear code that allows me the recovery of the whole computation of you know, k out of n, etc. But, uh, but if I lose something for whatever reason, let's say I fix a certain time, I only wait at the time where it responds. If you don't respond, I kind of ignore those uh, servers. What I'm going to miss is actually parts of the gradient. So I'm not, you know, not losing, you know, like some computations of the gradient vector, but actually I'm getting kind of just some entries are lost. So I'm, get, I'm getting a partial you know, gradient recovery. But we know from the, the uh, for example, the uh, stochastic gradient descent literature is that I don't really need actually full gradient to kind of get a you know, uh, convergence result for you know, gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent. So I can actually trade off now. So instead of targeting a full recovery, like in pretty much all coded uh, computation uh, literature, we can actually trade off this kind of reliability, so I can allow partial recovery by and at the end, you know, uh, in return, uh, speeding up of each iteration. Now, you know, very simple kind of uh, setting here. Let's say I, I want to do this kind of uh, WX matrix multiplication. I divide it into four parts for four workers. Comp computation load is two. Either I can use this kind of MDS coded thing that you know any two out of four will be sufficient. Here, if I do this code. You know, each worker computes you know, these multiplications, these linear, you know, like combinations. And if I get two workers out of four, I will be able to kind of uh, recover the result. Or I can just, you know, uncode it. So each give like two parts to each, you know, like, and I tell them, okay, compute one, send the result, compute the second, send the result. So it's again, multi-message. And I will stop, for example, I can stop, you know, like even either I, 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 I try to recover the full gradient or I can stop, you know, recovering three out of four, whatever. Now, our code is something like this. So we are saying that now I uh, design a code which has lower degrees in the, uh, so for example, here they first compute, you know, like one row each, and then some, you know, linear combination. So the idea here is that, you know, like they will all return as soon as they compute. But for example, if worker four is for some reason struggling, now you can see that, you know, like I get kind of different linear combinations of W4, which I can recover, you know, from, you know, if I, for example, if I get W2 and this one, I can get W4 as well. Or if I get W3 and this one, I get, I will get W4. So it's kind of adaptive uh, redundancy. So the motivation of this is that, you know, it's unlike in that kind of erasure coding uh, setting where all the erasures are equally likely. Here, because of this kind of uh, staggered computation, so there's an order of computations, these messages are not erased with equal probability. So that's why I basically design, need to design a code with an increasing degree distribution. So that's why, you know, like that's what, so it's a very simple course implementation of that. And here you can also see, for example, what kind of com uh, uh, result uh, scenarios, let's say, you know, here NI is the number of workers that completed high computations. You know, you know, you can have, for example, just one, uh, let's say all of them computed two, you know, in the first row, uh, two computations, or, you know, in the last row, you have like four servers computed one computation, uh, sorry, one, one computed, four computations and uh, one uh, 
uh, computed uh, none. Uh, thing, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so anyway, so for all these kind of different uh, scenarios, uh, we can actually have, you know, we can look basically how many of those scenarios each code can recover. So we can see that actually this partial code will do, you know, at least as good as, you know, all the other codes, but better in many scenarios. So there are many scenarios that it, it can recover full gradient that others may not. But more kind of impressively, if we actually say that I'm okay with recovering three out of four gradients, now our code is also better, you know, even better than uh, these two alternatives. And this, of course, reflects in, you know, if I kind of use this tolerance parameters of what percentage, you know, like I am okay not to recover. Now you can see that, you know, average completion time of our, this kind of partial gradient schemes becomes much lower. Again, of course, the communication load compared to this uh, MDS coded kind of scheme is, is higher, but, you know, there's a trade-off. So and it actually also reduces if I play with the tolerance. So this gives, let's say, another kind of, dimension in a way i'm using this kind of computation the coding idea to reduce to play with the trade-off between communication and coding okay so this is uh, more or less about uh this distributed training but here if you notice that uh, the kind of motivation was slightly different than what i talked before so the original i was talking more about you know the physical layer aspects how i would use coding to recover to overcome uh, the, the error in the channel and here I use kind of, you know, again, the ideas from coding theory communication to more overcome uh, errors, not necessarily due to communication, not, not from definitely physical channel, but could be from communication network, but also, for example, for the, for the processing speed. So that's another kind of dimension in, uh, that we need to take into account when we talk about machine learning problems. So now in the federated learning, I will go a little bit back to the, you know, that very briefly, you know, uh, this kind of physical layer aspect. So as I said, in the federated learning approach, we have many devices, each with its own data set. They are trying to learn a common model. So the way it's done, so we use basically this kind of distributed stochastic gradient descent approach, but, you know, each will compute uh, either a gradient or if they do multiple iterations, they will compute some model update and then send it to the, this kind of central server, which will update the global model, broadcast it to the devices again, and they will again do local computation and so on and so forth. So they will, this way, you know, instead of uh, sending their data to the server, they will communicate through this kind of either uh, gradients or model updates. So this is kind of motivated for privacy. Of course, you know, there are kind of recent work that uh, questions how much privacy should this provide you. Uh, but okay, so so now in the case of so in the in the machine learning literature again, so they, they typically you know look into you know either rate limited links, etc. So they don't really consider these devices to be in a you know shared wireless medium. So this is more you know for us the motivation is that if for example these are mobile devices that are in the same cellular environment and they need to now for this kind of uplink sending their model updates, if they need to share the wireless medium, how can we do it? So we know that. You know, when you actually have multiple devices, we, we, we have developed all sorts of different resource allocation, you know, uh, uh, radio access network protocol. So how should we kind of tweak those for this type of problem? Because here now, we don't really care about the rate of the communication. We are interested in more kind of the end-to-end -end, uh, accuracy of the model. So we looked at a simple kind of scenario where, you know, if you have a one uh, cellular system, many devices, you're training, you know, you want to train this kind of uh, a model through federated learning. So we said that if, if you just uh, orchestrate this through the base station, one macro base station, all the devices need to communicate with this device, uh, macro base station. Of course, they non, you know, they need to transmit maybe with higher power. So they are all sharing these resources. Now, alternatively, what we can do is actually we can introduce some sort, sort of kind of a hierarchical network architecture where we have this kind of small uh, base stations and actually which they can do some local learning and then only once in a while they can update the model at the base station. So this kind of this hierarchical structure. So this will improve uh, both actually to improve both the learning uh, kind of accuracy, but also gains, of course, in terms of the communication. So here, a very simple result, you know, uh, comparison for, for, for uh, CIFAR 10 image classification. You can see that. So the baseline is if, if everything is central, centralized. And here, federated learning, if it's, you know, just through the macro, everything is orchestrated. You can see that, you know, this slower and the final accuracy is lower 
because they, they, they can have much less kind of, they're more limited than let's say by the furthest user from the, uh, at the cell edge. Whereas if I introduce now these kind of local learning mechanisms, so it becomes much more uh, efficient, much better basically. So this is kind of a way to show that, uh, an example to show that how you know, this kind of resource allocation has to interact, has to take into account the machine learning problems, specific needs uh, to, do the to solve the optimization. Now I will go back to kind of the type of uh, uh, model that I had initially, where I again introduce the physical layer aspect. So here in the, uh, and I think it's a kind of a nice, interesting uh, observation and a very kind of significant uh, an illustration of how machine learning and uh, wireless channel would interact. So as I said, in the in the uh, this federated learning approach, at each iteration, each device, let's say, computes a gradient estimate, and they need to transmit these over this kind of shared wireless medium to the parameter server, which will eventually take average of these estimates and update the model. Now, again, the, the, the standard approach would be that, okay, so let me use some kind of, you know, uh, communication scheme, some radio access uh, protocol, some channel code modulation. So now each device is given some, uh, resource, channel resource, so they can transfer at a certain rate. So which will require them to, you know, compress their gradients at to, to this rate and then communicate as reliably as possible at the, and the parameter server does the, you know, update. But this is, you know, again, this is a separation based approach. So this is still an interesting problem. So the whole kind of, you know, uh, allocation, optimization of these resources, how we should do the compression of the gradients, efficiency, so on and so forth. But uh, there is another kind of more interesting observation is that <clears throat> I actually, uh, I mean, the problem here is, you know, I don't really need to send each of these uh, gradient vectors reliably to the parameter server. All the parameter server wants is the, their average. So this is not a communication, you know, in the uh, uh, strict sense problem, but it's actually a computation problem. It's actually a lossy computation problem over a noisy multiple access channel. And so what we propose here is actually, instead of doing this kind of first gradient compression and then channel coding resource allocation and all of this, we said that why don't we just take these gradient vectors and then just transmit them as they are in an uncoded fashion over the wireless kind of in a synchronized manner so that the wireless channel is actually just adds them. So the wireless channel also already has this kind of signal superposition property. So they, are, they will be already added and the parameter server is happy. So it doesn't need to do anything more. So of course, you know, the first challenge is that uh, these parameter vectors are typically huge. So we need to uh, somehow reduce the dimension. So for that, we proposed gradient sparsification followed by random linear projection. This is kind of an idea that we borrow from compressive sensing, right? So we reduce with this kind of random, uh, pseudo random projection. So now we have, so we don't need to kind of send the entries of all these kind of uh, sparse vectors, so that reduces the communication requirement, and they are, again, uh, naturally aligned over the air. So we, we showed actually that this is so much better because now basically we are kind of doing a distributed beamforming using the power of all these devices rather than actually sharing them, uh, allocating the resources to them. So here you can see that this analog approach is almost as good as error-free shared link and much better than all other kind of digital approaches. And if the data is non-AID, it actually, interestingly, it gets the, the, the gain is even more. And, and yeah, so here we are basically showing that this kind of uh, the trade-off between the how much you sparsify, how much you transmit over the channel. And the second challenge that, uh, of such a scheme is, of course, you know, the, before I assumed, you know, the channel adds them with the same gains. That's what I want. But typically, there are different channel gains. So I have to kind of take care of that because I don't want to create bias towards phone user. But for that, we can, we can if we know the channel gains, we can estimate these channel gains and apply some sort of channel inversion at the device, some, uh, some power allocation algorithm. So that would still be fine. So here we are showing that basically this is possible. Uh, you can still uh, get very good training accuracy with this analog scheme, much better than the digital alternatives. But uh, we, we later also show that you don't even need this channel estimation if you can uh, use multiple antennas at the base station. So this is kind of the, uh, using this multiple antenna benefits of multiple antenna uh, to kind of compensate for lack of uh, channel state information. So here we are showing that as the number of antennas increase, you can see that, you know, with this analog uh, scheme, you get uh, 
better and better performance, almost as good as uh, the, the having all the data centrally. So, uh, so this this problem, I think, in general. So, this is uh, there are many, many kind of uh, interesting problems along this line. Whether you do digital or kind of analog, uh, you know, uh, transmission of this, either the the gradients or the model updates. Uh, so, we recently, for example, looked into you know how when you do this kind of uh, allocation, you know, who transmits, how because when you decide who transmits, in the case of, for example, especially wireless channel. You might decide on, you know, for example, the users with the bad channel don't transmit because you need to align them all at the same power level. So now you need to kind of have a decision rule whom to schedule at each uh, iteration that should depend both on the channel but also kind of the significance of their gradient estimates. So kind of that will be kind of interesting interactions between the the machine learning aspect, you know, the significance of data and the, the channel aspect. So the, how good the channel of each device. Uh, will be. So I'm going to uh, wrap up here. So this was, of course, a very kind of uh, short, uh, uh, brief uh, introduction to these kind of uh, problems in the in the federated learning setting. But I guess the the main message, as in the rest of the talk, is the fact that you know when communication comes into picture, particularly if you know the physical layer is there, then you know we definitely need to you know take this communication aspect into account because you know the channels will introduce you know delays errors uncertainties there's all sorts of kind of channel imperfections and just assuming that okay so we have already these communication protocols that take care of all these things is not going to be uh, sufficient in the at the least we will need to kind of optimize the parameters of these kind of uh, solutions that will match the the requirements of the learning algorithms but if you want to go even further then we need to do a redesign a complete redesign of the a joint uh, machine learning and communication system okay so i will uh stop here as i said initially so for more important information for kind of more uh recent publications along kind of these uh, lines you can uh, check our group website and we had a, a recent now the time is passing so fast and the kind of the, the developments in this area are so fast that you know this this feels like uh, quite in the past but so we had this paper based the machine learning in the air that uh, overviewed kind of the the challenges and the promises of using machine learning for uh, communication problems or using uh, kind of improving the communications aspect of machine learning problems so i didn't touch uh, upon the the first aspect too much here where how we can use machine learning tools to improve uh, communication systems uh, but that's also of course a very interesting uh, research direction okay so i will uh, stop here now uh, i think we have some time very little time for uh, questions so in the first part of the presentation when you were talking about inference and this uh, joint source channel coding scheme I was wondering about the training of this scheme because it seems like there might be a risk that you overfit the channel scheme to the particular channel. So is there a risk that you're training for one channel and then the channel changes and suddenly it doesn't work anymore? And if so, how would you combat this? Yes, okay, very good question. Uh, I mean, in general, yes, there is that risk, but uh, I think that, that risk is of course there even for all our communication systems, right? We, we assume some model, design some communication system, and then you know we expect that it will work in practice. We don't know, you know, if the practice will fit into that uh, initial model assumptions that we had or not. So what we observed, uh, kind of empirically, let's say, is that actually these solutions are quite uh, generalizes quite nicely. In the sense, the one that I mentioned, for example, which we uh, also having the this deep JSCC paper is that if the SNR changes, these are like they they really nicely uh, work. So even if you train for a specific SNR, and if you if you reduce the SNR, increase the SNR, the performance actually changes gracefully. So they don't completely disappear, you know, uh, like in digital. And and also we looked at different kind of more kind of uh, fading, you know, like scenarios where you know different parameters of the channel changes. Again, empirically we observe that actually they they work fine. Of course, you know, if you have kind of richer models, the way you know in these things it it would work it would change in the practice, whatever you can even train taking those into account. That's what something we didn't do. 
But I think actually these models are quite powerful in much, much, much more powerful than let's say our very fixed model based uh, solutions. Okay, that's very fascinating. I thought it would be a much greater risk then, but it sounds like it might be quite robust. That's yes, and I think the main feature is this kind of analog aspect, as I said, because we are not designing like a digital kind of thing, right? So that's very, in the digital design, you really target a very kind of fixed, uh, you know, you design optimally to an exact kind of channel uh, model. Mm, I see. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is again in the distributed infer inference, uh, you have showed this dis uh, distribution of uh, the neural network between the local device and the edge. So there I want to just understand what are the numbers here, like uh, if you want to uh, upload the image of the dog or if you want to upload uh, the uh, parameters of this neural network, like uh, what will be the difference? I mean, uh, yeah, okay. So, I mean, the so I gave this kind of, uh, I, I guess I will, I, I will not now, you know, like go back to the slide, but and hopefully you remember and the, the slides will be available later. So you can, you know, uh, so, so if you just look at in terms of pure dimension, mm -hmm. so that plot was showing, you know, how the dimension changes. So let's say you have an image dimension, typically, you know, height, width times the th three colors. Mm -hmm. So that would be your input dimension. So it's pure kind of re number of real numbers that you represent your data that you would normally feed into your network. And then, you know, the, the other numbers we're showing as you go kind of layer by layer in your network, what is the size of the features that you feature vectors or matrices you will have? So if I cut the network there, how much, how many real numbers that I need to pass to the next layer? Okay, so uh, I was wondering if that would be smaller or greater, like, because it would, to me, it feels like if you can send the image itself, right? Because in neural network, uh, I uh, I am not completely a, an expert here, but uh, in neural network, I heard that there will be like millions of parameters, something. Yes, like exactly. That, depending okay. on the... So first, you know, we are not talking about, you know, the all the neural networks. So, I mean, we are talking about like how many features there is at each kind of, after each layer. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. But you are right, and actually that figure was exactly showing that. So if you look at actually in typical this type, especially deeper neural networks, so the dimension initially goes high, so you kind of expand your data in a larger space, and then you you again project it in a like a lower dimensional space. So that's typically the trend. So if you actually are very limited in computation power, and if you want to do a few layers. Actually, you yes, you do a few layers of computation, but you end up transmitting a lot. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of the main thing, right? So that, that, that we are addressing actually. So you are right, and that's the challenge. And, and basically you need to do, so you need to find a way kind of to transmit that much larger dimensional information in a very efficient manner. Otherwise, yes, you would just transmit the image. Okay, 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 thank you. So, and, and the second question is when you're doing coding for this uh, gradient computation mm -hmm. uh, to avoid the, the struggling, uh, uh, to overcome the struggling nodes uh, problem, mm -hmm. uh, there uh, I, I didn't completely get how the convergence time of the finally trained model will get affected when you're doing the coding. Okay, so if you are doing like normal gradient coding, the original kind of is in that paper, uh, you are actually getting full gradient. So you are, you, every iteration, you are recovering the exact gradient across all data sets. So that will have the same convergence time as gradient descent. Okay. The, the main difference is that the time it takes for each iteration will be different. Mm -hmm. that, that is the time that you, you need to collect enough data to recover the full gradient. Now, if you do different schemes, for example, you know, uh, in our, this partial gradient scheme, so we are actually allowing some noise in the gradient. So that, you know, that is, you know, you need to do kind of a convergence analysis. If, if for example, you know, that's, you know, you, you make sure that that noise you introduce is unbiased. So that's kind of, you know, standard, you know, there is, there's a way. But again, the main issue here, you know, most of these things will converge, but mm -hmm. the main trade-off is in the kind of, you know, uh, the time of, you're playing with the time it takes for each step of these things. Uh, th that's where my confusion is. If you if you look at SGD, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, even yeah. if you take a, uh, like a, I mean, theoretically, even if you take a single example, then yes. you you will you might end up converging faster than sure. SGD. That is known, right? So, 
so uh, the, you, you, once once you are doing coding and uh, i mean doing all this uh, bringing in all these intelligent techniques how much gain we will get in terms of converge time convergence time is what i am uh, yeah so so i mean that's exactly you know like the the kind of the comment i try to make is that it in, in the end it all boils down to how actually how much time do you really co take to communicate these things and to compute these things Mm -hmm. Yes, in SGD, you know, like you might end up having faster conversions, but it also, you know, depends on the fact that, you know, it takes like one unit of time compared to, let's say, you know, whatever that's, you know, like you're doing one batch instead of maybe 100 batches computation, right? So you have this kind of linear uh, gain of based on the batch size, and then you, you do less iterations. But, you know, so here when you distribute things, it's not clear basically that, you know, how these things scale. I mean, you can even say that, yeah, I will get like one batch, but there's still some sort of, you know, because of the computation speeds, because of the communication speeds, you know, these things are not as clear. They are not just, you know, like counting this number of operations or counting the number of iterations. I mean, and another thing is, of course, I, I should also say that one thing is the, the convergence behavior, but another thing is that it, what happens in the practice, right? I mean, for different, and my, my kind of uh, take on that is that this will depend a lot on, you know, what is the type of problem that you are using, you're mm. solving, and of course also the, the real implementation, what kind of communication protocol you have. I mean, it will be different if you're in a server farm, all these things are connected through uh, wires compared to a edge net network scenario where you know, yeah, you're know you connected wireless or whatever. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Regarding the gradient coding, uh, actually, so, it, I wasn't really clear that uh, the base assumption is that you need to have access to essentially all the, the server should have access to all the data and then decide on how to engineer this data dissemination over the users, right? Whereas in many cases, especially concerning networking scenario, we do have this data privacy, so we don't want essentially to share data. So then how we can somehow uh, Address yeah, this so, problem. I mean, yes, that's why I kind of group these into two different approaches. So all these kind of coded computation ideas are typically applicable when you can kind of uh, curate your data to the workers in the way you like. Mm -hmm. And uh, and especially this coded computation where, you know, this kind of Lagrange code, or whatever. so it all assumes that I have the whole data set, I do some coded, coded coding and then distribute it. So this is... This, these are especially, you know, maybe more relevant if I want to do some big computation using this type of co uh, servers, but there's also, there are also a lot of papers, for example, looking at the, the privacy of these things. So this coding also gives you some privacy. So that would be also a, a benefit of that. Now, if your data is distributed, you, you can't do that. And especially if the data is like fully distributed, if everybody has their own private data, if there's no data redundancy, I mean, there's no way. And if, and if you don't allow any kind of uh, exchange. So we, for example, had a paper where we said that, I mean, maybe I can, maybe it's possible that, you know, like if, for example, I am close to you, our data might share some, depending on what this data is, right? So we might share some part of our data. So that would give some natural redundancy. So could be the okay. case, some, some application. Or maybe you can allow somewhere again, you know, depending on the application, you can allow some local in, like exchanges. Maybe I don't trust the network. I, I don't want to send to the network, but maybe if I'm going to gain a lot, I can exchange with my neighbors to do some computations, you know, to, to have some redundancy. Maybe we agree, right? And then maybe that, will, that might be a, another way of kind of having mm -hmm. it. But you are right. I mean, so if, if this data redundancy is not there, that's, you know, those are not possible. Yeah, that's, that's actually very interesting because if we want to define the redundancy in the data, either we can we can be very in the deterministic setting where we can say that the data are like duplicated or we can say that the data are not duplicated but they are statistically the same or similar. Mm -hmm. For example, if we look at some big data sets like MNIST data set, uh, this is just coming from my experience, it has like 60,000 samples or examples in the data set. And if you just randomly throw away something like 50,000 of yeah. those samples, still you can recover the exact same solution. Essentially saying that 90% of those data are like redundant. So now if you re somehow distribute those redundant, statistically redundant data among different workers, uh, I, I know that probably the gradient coding, your approach as it is now, it won't work because mm -hmm. you need duplicate of the data, but have you thought about extending that? 
in my opinion, I, again, I mean, we, we need to think a little bit care carefully, but I think that type of redundancy is actually what is exploited in more kind of this stochastic optimization technique. So when you do stochastic gradient descent type of things, I guess intrinsically, that is what you are exploiting. Mm -hmm. anyway, so if you, for example, that, like when we do, for example, this kind of federated learning implementations, so what we do in some, some, you know, you, some simulations, you can just randomly distribute this, you know, uh, MNIST data set. And then every time you just schedule one of them or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So that is good enough because as you said, you know, like this, what you get is kind of representative enough. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, this kind of federated learning also kind of becomes harder if you do non-IID. So if you put all the classes, you know, the same data of classes in each user, for example, then you don't have that benefit. So mm -hmm. I think the gain, you know, the, the kind of trade-off there is more or less because of this type of statistical redundancy. So it comes into more... Uh, uh, into picture there mm -hmm. but if you want to use this kind of more kind of re very coding theoretic ideas that you really want to recover something you have a uh, coded versions of it I, yeah i'm not sure you know mm -hmm. how so that's a very interesting thing actually like, yeah that's it's more very like a distributed compression type of thing mm -hmm. right so we have correlated data we want to recover a co kind of a combination a function of that data can we do still coding we know we can but probably we need a very good sure. model of that statistics mm -hmm. So that because be to me, yeah. yeah, because to me, one of the greatest benefit of gradient coding is coming from this robustness to straggler, which we know by definition SGD and those stochastic algorithms are not that much robust. So if somehow it can be addressed, it would be pretty cool, I guess. Uh, so any, any more questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, regarding the linear combination of the gradients that uh, you want to send when uh, you have uh, the small, the uh, kind of slowest uh, worker, mm -hmm. um, how do you uh, find uh, the slower worker and uh, how do you um, distribute the data set? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean that uh, if uh, we want to have uh, the data set that uh, distributed in a way that each workers don't have the other workers data set. Okay, what's the point to uh, other workers uh, be able to compute the gradients of others? Yeah, okay, so so first of all, this, this kind of typically this distributed computation against regular framework assumes you don't know exactly who will be struggling because if you know the speed, who is going to be slow, you, you don't even use it, so you don't even maybe like request the computation, so that would be in a way easier. So actually all the results are actually assuming we don't know who is going to be struggling and it might even change over time. And, and we are giving this, it's like, you know, I mean, the coding, both the coding scheme and the attitude approach is the same as erasure channel. So as if you are, you are generating coded data, some will be lost. You don't know which will be lost, but still, let's say out, K out of N will be enough to recover your, you know, what you want. So it's just the, to do the same thing in a coded comp computation framework. So in that sense, you know, like your first question, you know, like we don't really need to know that. So we kind of create this sufficient redundancy that any K out of N of the servers will be enough. Now, in terms of your question, like if you want, so here again, uh, so the, the data is centralized. So I am standing to, so there's no, in, intrinsically, there's no constraint on who has what data. I can send the same data to as many workers as I like in the kind of, if, I, if there's no additional constraint on that. But there are also, as I said, you know, this, this, at least the one I talked about was like that. But as I said, you know, there are also works that talk about privacy aspects, security aspects. So in that case, you might actually require, for example, the workers not to have any idea about, you know, what they are computing. And actually this coded computation gives you that in a way, because I'm sending each worker a random kind of computation of a polynomial at an arbitrary point. So it can have no idea about, you know, like on its own, it cannot interpolate that formula, that, that polynomial. So it, it will get zero information. So that's actually an additional benefit of these, these schemes. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Thank you.